In this video, we're going to cover places you can find water after a disaster that many will simply overlook. There are places you can find in a typical urban suburban environment, and with a little knowledge and a few tools, they could provide you water that can be easily processed, giving you a precious gallon or two to ensure your survival. This video is a standalone video in a collaboration with several other fantastic YouTube preparedness channels as part of the 30 Days of Preparedness Collaboration and National Preparedness Month. I'll link to those channels in the comments below that are involved in this project. After the electricity goes out, the failure of the water system is probably second. You are hopefully sitting on your stored water when it does. Still, you may need to continue to collect water and get it from other sources to maintain a supply of drinkable water and extend your chances of survival through a disaster. The truth is, water, it's all around us, even in the desert. I'll structure a dozen or more locations working out from your home where you can find water after a disaster. You just need to know where to look for it and how to extract it. When others are desperate and fighting for every drop, you'll be a couple of steps ahead of everyone armed with this knowledge. So let's dive in. Please consider subscribing to our newsletter by clicking on the link in the description and comment section below. If you enjoy this video, please subscribe and click the like button to help the channel grow. Let me be upfront and tell you that this is not a video about water storage, treatment, filtration, or purification. When a prolonged disaster impacts an area, the municipal water supply can be rendered unsafe to drink. So have a plan to make sure your water is drinkable. And if you don't have a water storage setup, I would encourage you to do so now as there is no better option. I'll post a link in the cards above and in the description section below to water storage options and a video on how to process water to make it safe for drinking. So let's look at some of the overlooked places where you can find water after a disaster, starting in your home and moving outwards. Number one, your home. If a storm is approaching and you have enough advance warning, top off all of your water supplies. Fill all your large containers, sinks, and bathtubs. And don't forget that any ice in your refrigerator will keep things colder when the power goes out, but as it melts, you'll still want to capture the water. There is also water in your pipes you can access, even at the municipal water stops, and can be accessed by opening your lowest tap or faucet. If you suspect the water coming to your house is compromised, immediately shut off the water valve coming into your residence to protect the water in the pipes. Even when pumping stations fell, Municipal water sources use as much gravity as possible to get water to you. The power may be out, and the water will eventually stop flowing to you, but it will still flow for a while, so capture as much of it as you can as long as you have no reason to believe it's contaminated. Number 2. Canned Foods Canned foods are typically packed in either sugar or sodium water, and don't throw that water out. You can use any fruit syrups directly in your cooking, or drink them straight for an energy boost. The saltier brine, like your vegetables and beans, can be mixed with a little stored water to provide vital electrolytes. You should avoid drinking the saltier brine straight, as this could dehydrate you. If you can dilute it by adding water, you will derive more significant benefits. Hot water heater. You walk by, probably every day, around 40 to 50 gallons of water stored in your water heater. But would you know how to tap into it after disaster safely? Here's how. Start by turning off the gas supply line by turning the valve to the off position. Then you want to wait a while to allow the water to cool off. Then find the larger lever, which is the water source line, and close that off as well. Then open the pressure relief valve to vent any high pressure. Finally, with a bucket under your water heater, open the drain valve to capture the water. If you do this in 5 gallon increments with a 5 gallon bucket, you can get a solid 40 to 50 gallons here. You can show a neighbor how to do the same in exchange for another five or more gallons off their water here. Number four, toilet tank. I know this may be a bit hard to believe, but that back tank on your toilet has some of the cleanest water you'll be able to get your hands on after a disaster. The water comes in fresh from your municipal lines and is sealed off from fecal matter, so you could, in a crisis, drink it right out of the back of the toilet, but it never hurts to treat it or filter it just to be safe. If you use chemicals in the reservoir like the kind that releases with each flush, you will need to treat and filter that water. The water in the tank is good, but you have to be genuinely desperate to drink from the bowl. You would definitely want to treat the water before you drink it from there. However, it's okay for your pets. Many bacteria that could make us sick, they don't even notice. Don't overlook this supply of water. Irrigation lines. Do you have sprinklers in your yard? If you do, you're surrounded by water. Most irrigation lines are 3 4 inch or 1 inch. 
there are 231 cubic inches in a gallon. If my math is correct, the average suburban lot of 5,000 square feet will have a little over 420 feet of PVC irrigation, including lateral lines. If that's a one inch line, that's gonna be at least two gallons and likely more of water just sitting in the underground lines of every similar built house in your subdivision or neighborhood. To tap into this water source, you just need to know the width of the metal thread or riser. Have polyethylene or vinyl tubing to put into that riser and the lowest sprinkler head. If there's a lower head in the system, it may weep naturally when the system is not on, and it is easy to identify in older systems. If the sprinklers are all built level, you can tap into any one, but you need to have a hand pump to extract the water. In fact, a hand pump with extra tubing can be a great addition to your prepping supplies because it will allow you to run a line to water sources that are out of your reach. Clear the dirt water from under the sprinkler head with a shovel or trowel. Unscrew the sprinkler head and quickly put the tube into the riser. The water may have sufficient hydrostatic pressure to begin to flow and drain. If not, a small hand pump will be of great use to you. Also, a large sponge will allow you to collect water that is lost between the time you detach the sprinkler head and attach your collection tube. Just realize though that water meant for irrigation is not 100% safe for consumption. Always treat and filter water collected in this way. Number six, transpiration in plants. It won't provide you a lot of water, but placing a plastic bag tightly over the leaves will capture small amounts of water through what is called transpiration. Excess water drawn up from the plant's roots is expelled in this process. The plastic bag seals the leaves in and captures the water out of this transpiration stream. The water will collect through the hottest times of the day. Harvest your water in the evening or early morning when water vapors have converted to liquid form. Be careful though that the plant you're harvesting from isn't toxic. Depending upon your climate, you may be able to harvest dew. Also, some cactus and succulents are edible and store large amounts of water. You can eat aloe vera and pear cactus plants to provide you vital water. Know what plants are in your area because you don't want to be experimenting and taste testing after a disaster. Number seven, harvesting rain. Draping a tarp and collecting rain is an excellent way to capture natural water sources, assuming you get rain after a disaster. How much water can you gather from rain? Well, to calculate this, take your tarp's square area and multiply it by inches of rainfall and then by 0.62. Length times width times inches of rainfall times 0.62. So a standard 10 by 12 tarp collecting one inches of rainfall will collect an incredible 74 gallons of water. After a disaster, realize that this same equation can be used to calculate rainfall on your roof as well. If your roof area is just 20 by 40, that same one inch of rain will be coming down your gutters to equate to 248 gallons of water. Make sure your gutters aren't just draining into the dirt. Have a plan or system in place to channel and collect the water. Number eight, fire hydrant. Moving to the street, and while probably not exactly legal, you can obtain water from municipal lines by tapping into fire hydrants. Note that everybody else will be trying to get water in this way too. Be careful as hydrants are under tremendous pressure. This high pressure can easily cause injury. Were you to try and tap a hydrant, the method would be to unscrew the outlet then gently loosen the stem nut in a counterclockwise manner. If you keep this action slight, you'll be able to regulate the flow and won't risk depressurizing the entire system. Loosening the stem nut opens the valve at the drain hole at the stem of the hydrant. Make sure you have a sizable collection container and you're gonna need a large wrench to do this. Number nine, commercial buildings. While we're on the topic of tapping municipal water supplies that aren't ours and are technically stealing Many preppers make sure to have a four-way silcock key in their bug out bags. Every commercial billing has an external water outlet. If the water's flowing, you simply put the silcock key in and turn it counterclockwise to open the valve. Even if the water is out, the hydrostatic pressure of the latent water in the billing will often still force the water out. So even if the water's out, you would be draining the stored water in the pipes of the billing. Number 10, ponds, fountains, and pools. Ponds, fountains, and pools are large quantities of water, but they're not safe for consumption unless properly treated, which is possible. I'll post a link in the cards above to a video detailing various approaches to safely treat water like these sources. Basically, there's two things that can make you sick or kill you from this water. Organic components and chemical components. Pathogenic bacteria, protozoa, amoebas, and algae can all make you sick. There are also many toxic chemicals that run off or are directly put into ponds, fountains, and pools. Filtering these sources of water can be a lifesaver 
something we'll cover in the next video. One thing about finding these sources, while the grid is up before disasters, it's not a bad idea to get familiar with your neighborhood and surrounding area using something like Google Maps using the satellite view. If you have a drone, you may want to consider surveying your neighborhood in advance to identify sources of water such as pools or small ponds in people's backyards. Now obviously never trespass into someone's backyard, but if the grid goes down and people leave their home and it's abandoned, you may be able to safely access these sources. But just know, you may not be the only one doing so. Number 11. Springs and wells. Get to know your area's old water systems are still all around us, unseen and overlooked. Often wells and springs were sealed off when municipal water lines were built. It's no longer necessary to haul up buckets of water, so they fell into disuse. Taking a walk through the historical parts of your community and trying to find these hidden stores of water is a valuable exercise before disaster strikes. Knowing where they are and how you can access them after a crisis, it could be a lifesaver. With a little research, you may be able to find some of these sources. Number 12. Lakes, Creeks, Streams, and Rivers I wouldn't quite label this last source as an overlooked option per se, but for many urbanites and suburbanites, they may not consider these options as they are not sure how to process these water sources to make them safe for drinking. There's a few simple things that you can observe before trusting these sources. When collecting water from the wild, it's essential to see if other animals are enjoying that water. If there are many tracks around the lake or stream, you know that other animals enjoy and thrive in this source. If there are dead fish, large green algae blooms, or white or red bacterial blooms, the water will need some heavy filtration and treatment before it can be consumed. If it has an oily or murky sheen, try and find another source. Think of anything upstream that may be running into the water supply. Our ancestors drank straight from flowing creeks, streams, and rivers, and their bodies were hardier as a result. They also died at a younger average age than we do today. Contaminated drinking water is estimated to cost 485,000 diarrheal deaths worldwide each year. After a disaster is not the time you want your body to adjust to an occasional organic organism. If this water is your only option, you can drink it if you filter it and treat it appropriately. Finding water sources after a disaster is critical to your long-term survival strategy. That's the first part of the equation when you need to move beyond the water you have stored and on hand. The second part is rendering that water drinkable. There are other videos on that. Hopefully, these dozen or more places to find water have got you thinking, observing, and locating water sources around you that you can tap into in case of an emergency. You can only store so much water, and you need two to three gallons per day just to survive. Know where the water is around you now for when you may need it later. What do you think? Are there any other sources of water around you that I didn't mention here? What's your water strategy in an SHTF situation? Let us all know in the comments below. I read many of the comments and respond to them when I can, and that's typically within the first hour of releasing a video. I can notify you when other videos become available if you subscribe to this channel. It's a little thing, but it helps us grow our community. As always, stay safe out there.